everybody. My name is Aliza Abrams Koenig. I'm the Director of Alumni Affairs at YU. We are so appreciative that you're all joining us today for what's going to be a really lively and engaging conversation. And I'm very much looking forward, as I'm sure all of you are. Uh, before we dive into the conversation, I just want to share everybody, I want to share with everybody, I'm going to quickly share my screen to just show everybody um, a really exciting event that we have coming up. December 15th, it is being hosted by Yeshiva University Alumni Affairs, but it is open to everybody who is either an alum or a friend of YU. If you're interested in joining us, you can uh, check out the website down here, yuwines.com. The deadline to order is Friday. So please make sure to join us. It's on Tuesday night of Hanukkah, the fifth night. Everyone will be getting three bottles of wine. Uh, which is going to be a really wonderful tasting. And just so you know, our Israeli counterparts, it's actually going to be, we're going to have two, well, it's three wineries that are from Israel, two people based in Israel, waking up in the middle of the night to present. So if you are interested, you can do it too. Um, but it's going to be a really wonderful evening. And we look forward to everyone joining us. So if you have any questions about that, I, we can certainly uh, pop the file into the um, chat so you can check that out on your own time. And with that, I'm going to um, also just tell everybody to please note that we are we changed the registration links for these events. So if you had registered in advance at some point earlier um, in the last few months, please note that we need you now to re-register for the upcoming events because we had a little glitch on the back end. We want to make sure that everyone gets the information. So that's why the email that went out on Monday and moving forward will always have a new registration link per event. Um, so we just want to make sure that everybody gets the information. And now with that, I will pass it over to Lawrence to introduce our panel. Thank you. Actually, and Lisa, if I can uh, ask you, for this event, for the wine event, can people in Israel, because we have a lot of people in Israel on this call, can they participate in this event too? Can they get the three bottles of wine also? So that's a great question. Unfortunately, we can't have them shipped to you. I'm happy to share the names of the bottles of wine. They're actually all listed on the website. You can pick them up yourself and um, taste them along with us. And we can send you the information to register that way for the event. It will be at 3 a.m. for Israelis. So I'm not sure if anybody wants to really join that hour, but we are planning an Israel time-based tasting before Purim in a couple of months. So stay tuned for details on that. Exactly, exactly. Thanks for, uh, for clarifying that. Hi, everybody. Uh, I am not in Israel, despite the background, but um, when we do the Israeli-themed events, I try to come up with a different picture of Israel uh, when I put up a picture of downtown uh, Dizengoff, uh, I think some of the panelists were offended <laughs> by the look of the picture. So hopefully this picture from Hebrew University's uh, campus uh, is a nicer view for everybody. Um, thanks to everyone for joining again. Uh, this is a co-sponsored event for YU Wall Street and YU Technology. Uh, this is a, a great topic. I've had a chance to dabble in this topic quite a bit, being a telecom investment banker uh, and, and working in technology also. I've seen a number of the speakers uh, at past conferences, whether in Israel or in Barcelona for Mobile World Congress. The world is obviously different, the same reason why we're not doing uh, our meetings in person. Um, th those conferences are not happening. And that's why we're trying to take advantage of this webinar format. And as Elisa said, have some of these events where we have speakers coming from Israel. And because YU has more alumni living in Israel than any other non-Israeli institution, uh, university, having these at this time at noon, allowing so many Israelis to participate, being on the panel, and uh, in the, uh, as participants also, we're thrilled about it. Uh, see, we're getting to about 40 or so participants. Please tell your friends, this is not for YU only. We're happy to have lots of people uh, be involved over here and really uh, listen to all of these events. Um, this particular event, we've done a different topic on investing in Israel. Some of that was more hedge fund, public private equity. This has got a different spin, not just on venture capital, but corporate venture capital, which is I think a little bit different. So it's a corporate approach to investing in some early stage companies with an Israeli angle on top of it. So I hope a lot of people who may be on early stage companies who wanna hear how do I go ahead and get in touch with the people from Cisco and, and Qualcomm and Amdocs and, and Western Digital uh, and others. Um, I apologize uh, for some people that I made them all tech uh, and telecom oriented. That's probably just my orientation. We certainly will try to do other events on health and clean tech and ag tech and all the other fascinating areas where Israel is really a leader. And I'm 
very excited to hear the discussion. I hope everyone will participate. You probably heard that we have things on mute. The chat bot is carrying on about my birthday, which was yesterday. Thank you everyone for the birthday wishes. And, uh, and with that, again, I wanna thank uh, all of the speakers for giving their time today. And let me hand it off to, uh, to Moshe, uh, who again, I've known for, for many years and, and uh, thank you for agreeing to moderate this discussion today. Thanks, thanks for having me, Lawrence. It's, uh, I, I missed you at Mo Mobile World Congress last year. And, uh, but the year before I remember uh, hanging out a little bit, which is fun. So what we're gonna talk about is uh, corporate venture capital. Uh, probably all of you know about venture capital, but uh, corporate venture capital as, as the name, as the name uh, suggests is when, when, a, when a corporate or a strategic uh, enterprise invests just like a financial, or we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how, how they invest differently. And, you know, I wanted to kick off, you know, with just a, a stat that came out this year that 50% of, of corporate venture investors and capital, 50% uh, of venture capital and 50% of venture capital investors are now corporate. So what started off, you know, maybe 10 years ago as, you know, Qualcomm, Intel, and Cisco three, you know, at least Qualcomm and Cisco are here on the call. They've been doing this for, for dozens of years, uh, you know, has become uh, par for the course in venture capital. And I would argue uh, an important and, and uh, an important part of the venture capital ecosystem in Israel and all over the world. We're going to try to get through today with, uh, with Amir and Meirav and Tomer is to talk a little bit about what makes it different and a little bit about uh, what makes it what makes it different in Israel and what makes it different to be a corporate venture capitalist. So what I think makes sense is we start off just by introducing ourselves, talk a little bit about you know what we do, where we do it, and uh, and uh, hopefully one 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 small story maybe about how you got to where you got uh, in terms of Cisco or Qualcomm or Western Digital. I'll start. So I'm Moshe, I've been at Amdocs for about six years now. Uh, I started off in M&A in Amdocs and uh, actually helped set up the venture capital efforts at Amdocs about three years ago. Um, before that, going way back, you know, my, my, my connection to YU is I went to high school at YU, so I, that counts for something, I think. I think that, that's why they made me moderator. Uh, and you know what? What 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 we tried? What we tried? Amdocs, for those who don't know, is, is a telecommunications-focused and media-focused software business. And we we invest out of our out of our balance sheet into uh, interesting interesting um, startups in Israel and abroad. So that's a little bit about me, Meirav. Why don't you take? Why don't you go next? And then we'll go to Tomer and Amir. So uh, I'm Rob Weinweb. I, I'm the managing director for uh, Qualcomm Ventures in Israel and Europe. I'm doing VC for the last almost uh, 12 years now. Uh, started my career at Pitango, which is one of the largest uh, financial VCs. Then moved to Intel Capital and ended up in uh, Qualcomm Ventures. Uh, we're the corporate arm of Qualcomm. We invest uh, in companies that are in Qualcomm domains, such as IoT, communication, industrial IoT and so forth. Um, we have uh, around 130 portfolio companies worldwide, um, around uh, 20 active in Israel. And I swear I, you know, uh, I thought about a funny story. Maybe I'll come up to it later, but right now nothing funny in my job or how I came to Qualcomm. So let me keep this one for later. <laughs> Tomer. Sure. Um, all right. So I'm, I'm Tomer Goldberg. Um, I'm part of the corporate development and Cisco investment team, um, which is uh, a little bit different than maybe some of the other investors we do. Uh, on the one side, we do kind of corporate venture, um, similar to the other investors. Um, we invest out of balance sheet um, around $200 million a year globally. Um, specifically around the focus areas for Cisco. So we do a lot of uh, anything that relates to enterprise networking, um, cloud and compute, um, cybersecurity, 
um, among, among other things. Uh, we typically um, invest in series A and above uh, in companies that we have strategic relevance in. Um, uh, the other thing that we do as part of the group is we're also the M&A arm of Cisco. So the same team does corporate venture as well as M&A, which is a little bit different than maybe some of the other corporate investors. Um, my background, so I've been four years with, with Cisco. Before that, I came from an operational background mostly. Um, I started my career um, in the Israeli Defense Force, I used to fly drones for the, for the military, uh, and then moved to aerospace and defense engineering, so mostly around product and system engineering. Um, went to uh, the US to get an MBA, um, went to Columbia, um, and then spent a few years at a VC fund in New York, um, a little bit of consulting, and then came back to my operational roots at Amazon, um, working on consumer products, uh, and came back to Israel about four years ago to, to join this team and uh, help lead the, um, the investments here. Um, so I guess maybe the funny story, I don't know if it's that funny, but I think uh, Moshe, it is kind of relates to a little bit about the ecosystem. So the way I got this job, which is very kind of, uh, um, I guess, not dissimilar to the way we, we kind of find investments here is I, I got this job through, through friends, right? This is a very tight um, ecosystem. Uh, and just someone told me that Cisco is looking to hire someone in Israel. Um, and, you know, one thing led to the other and, and, you know, now I'm here. So I think one of the things that you have to realize about the Israeli ecosystem is that everyone knows everyone and it's really close knit. Um, so uh, I think that's one of the things that I really like about the, the ecosystem. You know, every, everyone shares information and talks to, to, to one another. It sometimes um, makes our job a little bit more challenging but it's also fun. So oh. that's me. Thanks, Tamar. Amir? Yes. So first of all, pleasure to be with all this forum. Uh, Amir Friedman, uh, Senior Director of Corporate Business Development and Capital Investment uh, in Israel and in Europe. And I'm trying to stick to this order because most of the activity is around a partner creating partnership with the ecosystem here with the startup and the multinational corporates and of course the capital investment itself um, I always joke that I've been working for the same company for the past 20 years which is almost almost uh, true I, I started working for an Israeli startup in 2001 called M systems uh, we called ourselves the Flash Technology Pioneers. Uh, Dov Moran, you probably all heard about it, invented the USB memory and later on brought the NAND storage into smartphones, um, which was uh, later on acquired uh, by SanDisk in 2006, when SanDisk wanted to expand their offering from the retail to the OEM. And then was acquired by Western Digital in 2016 um, uh, when WDC wanted uh, to actually penetrate into the flash technology storage area. So three companies, but for me it's the same, the same building in Fasaba, uh, but the uh, storage space is always a change. And which bring me to the story that I wanted to tell, and I'm not uh, considered as a funny guy, but I still like this story. I started my career in M Systems in a relocation to Asia, running uh, between Taipei, Seoul, Tokyo, etc. And I remember that I was trying to convince Samsung Mobile to adapt a NAND technology, our product, into their first smartphone. And I came to them with an eight megabyte of storage and they told me, what are our users gonna do with it? You're crazy, eight megabyte is so big. And you know what uh, is eight megabyte of today. So I think this shows how storage is developing not only penetrating into new markets, but of course the technology enable us to provide today petabytes of storage when only 15 years ago we were talking about maybe megabytes. 
Um, I founded the SunDisk Capital in 2012 in Israel. Uh, when all the business moved to the US, uh, I left without anything to do. Um, and then I was looking what I'm gonna do next. And I found out that SunDisk doesn't have a venture arm, unlike Qualcomm and Cisco, for example. And uh, I started the activity here in Israel, which was expanded a little to Europe as well. Uh, and I continue to do it in Western Digital. Great. So th thanks for that, Amir. The, my, I think the, the best way to start uh, our forum, I think is to talk about the reasons why, why we invest. You know, a financial VC, I think it's pretty straightforward, right? They're measured on IRR. All of us uh, work for companies with billions of revenue. Uh, and, and it's hard to move the needle even if you have a, you know, a home run exit uh, in, in large organizations. So you're always, we're, all, we're always asked in Amdocs, you know, why, why do we have even a venture fund? I, I think there are a lot of reasons out there, but you know, Mayrav, why don't we start with you and Qualcomm? You know, what, what are the goals that Qualcomm you know, has set for its venture fund and, and you know, why, why invest? Why, why not just build? So uh, when Qualcomm founded uh, the VC back in 2000, the idea was to help the mobile ecosystem grow. So this is maybe a funny story because right now it's kind of obvious. So we, uh, we decided to invest in everything mobile. So we invested in the, uh, we invested in applications, in infrastructure, in chipset. Actually, we did some of our best investments then. We invested both in Waze in Israel and in Zoom in the U.S. Uh, so, so this was back then. Since then, uh, a lot has changed. And today, it really depends who you ask. As a fund, we're still measured on the financial returns, but we are also measured on the... Um, startups we bring to Qualcomm for cooperation, for m and uh, the technology insights we're bringing in. So it's, um, if you would ask, uh, I think many of Qualcomm's people, they will talk about the innovation, the access to the uh, startup universe, our ability to create uh, different forms of uh, cooperation with companies that we want to work with. So investments definitely help. Uh, but eventually it's very hard to measure on this. So when we go back to ourselves and try to measure, uh, to measure ourselves, it's always on the financial returns. So we're kind of a, a weird animal, a bit of a, a, a dual head kind of, but it works well. We, we managed to find both and so far it works pretty well. Tomer, let me, let me move to you. I, I, wearing both an M&A hat and, and an investor hat uh, at Cisco, yeah, how easy is it to bring new ideas around innovation when there are tens of thousands of people trying to innovate across Cisco? Uh, yeah, it's, yeah. How, how do you uh, manage to bring ideas that people say, wow, Tomer, I haven't heard of that before. You know, how do you bring new ideas? Or is it around, you know, uh, you know, filling holes or is it really looking beyond at the horizon of what's, what's beyond Cisco? Yeah, I think, so I think it's, a, it's, it's a combination, right? So um, I think the way we think about innovation, innovation comes in, in many different forms. We obviously, a, a lot of the innovation comes internally. We have a huge R&D force big budget. So everything we do needs to measure up. And I, I think the question we always get is, why wouldn't we just build it in house, right? Um, so, so I think the way you think about innovation is obviously some things will be built um, internally, but a lot of the innovation is happening outside. And then you have to figure out what is the mechanism that you want to engage with, with the market. Some of it comes through venture investment. Some of it comes through partnerships and some of it come through M&A. It's, it's different mechanisms. It's different ways to bring innovation into what we do. Uh, but we'll always, you know, we'll always have these levers that we can pull. Uh, and there's different, uh, I guess, ideas that you can bring uh, in different stages of the company. Uh, I think 
investing is 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 interesting because it enables you to place you know small bets in areas that you think would be relevant to the business, um, and and not necessarily take a large stake at a kind of a big architectural um, shift. You could just say, hey, this is interesting. Let's let's see how that plays out, and then that ends up at, at, at an m a or that ends up in a, in a place where we say hey actually this is not an area i want to play in uh so let's you know let's leave it and we have multiple stories like that i mean just to give you an example right sd wan big category we had a, a big idea around how do we build you know sd wan is basically software defined wan right how do you um, manage um uh, wide area networks uh by software um obviously cisco is a networking company um a lot of people just said hey we just build this forget about the market we'll just build it in-house and we did we had a, a huge engineering effort around sdwan but we also invested in a company called velocloud um guess what great company um it was just not the right fit from an m a perspective so we ended up buying a company called Viptela, which was actually a competitor to our portfolio company so that we could talk about that and that created a few interesting uh, areas but I guess the, the, the story here, the interesting part is that you could use investing in M&A as a way to bring outside innovation in a faster clip. And the market is so fast, you need to have that faster clip. Um, so that's our perspective. Um, Amir, in, in an in a industry like storage, which is so IP intense, you know, how do you deal with, on the one hand, trying to bring innovation via investments, but on the other hand, trying to, you know, main, you know, as, as an entrepreneur, are there IP questions? Do they, do they, are they, do they get somewhat suspicious around uh, a, a corporate investor getting too close to their IP? Excellent question and a true one. Uh, it's not easy. It's mainly when you going into the deep silicone IP area um, and therefore, much of the engagements on both sides uh, is uh, between product level and business level uh, to keep a separate wall in many cases between the startups we engage with and uh, our teams, especially in the first stage. Uh, of course, when the relationship become more tied and the, and the technology collaboration uh, is really created, then the doors are more open and it's the interest of both sides uh, to better collaborate. But uh, yes, IP is an issue and uh, we try uh, to you know, keep it uh, separately. And when it's not possible, this is a good sign for the next step. In some of the next case. step, next step being an MA or, or, or to, okay. Exactly. Fair enough. Fair enough. Let me, let me, let me open up, you know, um, you know, a, a little bit. And by the way, everyone should, you know, if you have questions for us, I think everyone's on forced mute, which is a bit violent, but I think the, the, the chat is open so everyone can ask, can ask questions on chat if there are any. Uh, you know, let, let, you know let, I, I, what I want to do now is you know, to, to, to spur a conversation. If we're, let's pretend that we're entrepreneurs for a minute, right? We all come from the investing community, but we're, we're, we're probably more entrepreneurial than, than, than corporate, each of us. So if we were entrepreneurs and coming to a corporate venture capital, what, what kinds of hard questions would you ask? And you know, well, what kinds of hard questions would you ask to a potential corporate investor um, to, to see if it makes sense or if it could be potentially a you know, mismatch? You know, Tomer, I see you smiling. So I'm gonna start with you this time. Yeah, so, I mean, I think, Look, I think when you when you take money from a financial VC, um, the alignment is pretty straightforward, right? Everyone wants to make money. Um, it's it's pretty straightforward that you know you're you're 100 aligned. I think once you um, once you take money from a corporate, you need to realize um, what's in it for the corporate that's investing in you, and more importantly, what you can get from that relationship. It doesn't mean, I mean, at least for us. 
um, we don't necessarily invest um, with the mindset of creating a partnership or an OEM right off the bat. Um, but you have to understand um, what is the type of endorsement you could get from the company. Sometimes it's just having you know Cisco as a uh, someone on your cap table uh, means a lot. It's it's some sort of an endorsement um, of your you know technical savviness or or kind of integration in, into the ecosystem. But you want to make sure at least we you know we think that you know corporate money needs to be differentiated um, from financial players in the sense that it actually creates value. So you need to understand because because that money comes with complications and a lot of corporates will ask for certain rights that you know financials VC won't necessarily care about. So you want to make sure that you leverage that um, to get what you need as an entrepreneur. And, uh, and that's important. Make sure that you understand and align the corporate to what you care about. I think that's really critical. Mirav from Qualcomm. I, I learned something from Qualcomm when I started the Amdocs. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you this. Uh, I learned something from Qualcomm uh, when we were setting up Amdocs Ventures, um, which was Mirror, you probably forget this, which, which, which was invest as cleanly as a financial would invest. You don't ask for anything special. Right. Uh, you right. know, so so Mirav, right. as, as I, I think there, which, which, we've, which we've done, by the way. Um, so thank you for that piece of advice. What, you know, if you're an entrepreneur coming to Qualcomm, you know, if I'm an entrepreneur coming to Qualcomm, what do I need to, what are the hard questions that I need to ask? So there's, you know, the, the story we tell and then there's the reality. And this is because of our dual head, the financial and the strategic. So ideally, uh, we would like to find ways that uh, we bring value to the company and the company uh, brings us value. It's very difficult in a semiconductor company uh, in terms of agreements because we work with very uh, small number of customers. Sometimes we invest in potential customers of Qualcomm, but that's again, a very side uh, uh, business. And, and most of our investments, when we're trying again to combine financial, financial returns are in ecosystem players that are interesting for us. And then down the road, we create all kinds of interesting engagements with our engineering uh, to educate them, sometimes to cooperate, et cetera. So uh, uh, this would be my answer to, to everybody that comes to an investor. Look at the person in front of you. Make sure that you want to kind of uh, almost marry him because after you got the investment <laughs> from him, you can't really get rid of him no matter what. So that's much, much more important than the brand name or the name of the fund or the that are important. And in many cases, I tell them, listen, you'll have Qualcomm on your cap table. It's, it's great. But my usual advice to an, an entrepreneur coming to us or anyone else, look at the person and make sure that the one that joins your board is someone you want to work with for the long run. Otherwise it becomes uh, a nightmare yeah. and no, no money and no brand name would help there. Yeah. Amir, from, from your side, what, you know, what, what, what advice would you give an entrepreneur looking for capital and considering corporate, corporate capital? So on one end, I want to say, when you're going to take uh, money from investor, it doesn't matter if it's a corporate VC or a VC. In the end of the day, as Marav said, it's almost like getting married. Uh, but on the other end, and we like to call it in our ecosystem, it's a smart money, okay? So when you're going to corporate VC, or looking for a corporate VC, and let's assume you have an appeal in technology and you are in a situation when you can get investment from several corporate VC. So Marav said, don't look for only for the best brand. I would say, look for your best partner, okay? Uh, I can give uh, examples uh, in my portfolio for companies that when I invested in them, I thought they're gonna be strategic. And after one quarter, we simply close, a, let's call it the strategic initiative. And that's, a, that's it. This company is no longer strategic for us. We still support them, especially if they are doing well, but I cannot bring them real value, okay? 
but uh, if, for example, I would get another company, the name is, which is more close to our DNA, core business, pure storage, let's call it pure storage. I mean, not the company name, but the uh, core storage of our business, then they will always be strategic for us. Yeah. And then it's a smart uh, investment. To, to, to liven up the panel a little bit, I mean, not that we're not lively as it is, but just to, pre to, present, to present a different view. You know, when we were setting up our venture, our venture fund, another piece of advice that we got was actually not to invest in things that we're doing. So not to invest in partners, not to invest in, in, uh, in anything that the business unit needs uh, us to invest in. Uh, to, to stay, if you will, at the, we call it at the horizon of our strategy. If it's in, on strategy, then it's not for the venture team anymore, right? We should be mm -hmm. learning about it, partnering with them. Uh, if it's too far out, then it's also not for us. So we, we spend a lot of time trying to define this like middle earth, this like boundary between strategy and, and outer space that, that, um, that has the the chance to impact our business, but is not definitely on strategy. So we invested, you know, in smart cities. Yeah, you know, the mayor Rob knows about, we were talking about it the other day. We invested, you know, in, in, in home connectivity. You know, we, we, we invested in machine learning uh, optimization. So all these things that, that have a huge impact on us, but are not our business today. Um, and which puts us in a weird position vis-a-vis -vis the entrepreneurs. Because when we, we actually like to invest in things where our value is a little bit more questionable, it's not like we're investing in a telco software business. You know, we're investing in machine learning with the idea that maybe AT&T will be interested in this in another year or two or three. And if so, then we can deliver them. So it's kind of like this mix between uh, what, I, what, I, what I heard Mayrav and Tomer talking about and Amir, what I heard you talking about, which is investing more on strategy. Yeah, but again, in, in, in uh, the investment in competitive uh, technologies is the most dangerous one. You get to conflict right away. Yeah, I agree. Uh, investment in, and investment in M&A targets, again, it's, uh, it's not always working very well. Uh, I think uh, Tomer gave, gave an example. You invest in one and then you acquire another. So all the investors on the one you invested in are really upset with you. The founders are upset with you. You, you end up with uh, many enemies and no financial return. So yeah. <laughs> I totally agree I, with this. And I guess it's also related to the- Why don't we offend it, Tomer? He dropped. Yeah, no, <laughs> he, he went to the audience for some reason. He's like, <laughs> okay. up there. Yeah, he's back. Amir, you were saying? I was saying, yes, I yeah. guess it's also related. That's, that's, that's because we're not using WebEx. Uh, but yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's related also to the company DNA and the ones that sit in your uh, investment committee, right? <laughs> I mean, if investment committee is purely uh, from your strategic group or in some of the corporate, the VC itself, then I guess it's much easier to invest in uh, companies that are not 100% related to your strategy or to the short-term business. When it's more related to the, your investment committee is more based on your corporate functions, other corporate functions when it be used, then guys are looking for their next, uh, you know, partnership and how they expand and increase their P&Ls. And then they less looks on other markets that are, they are, not really related to the next one, two years revenue. Yeah, we, we, have, we have some yeah, questions have some from questions the group, from the chat. So maybe I'll just say one thing, Amir, to, to that is we forcefully kicked out the business unit from our strategy, from our investment committee, because we found that they're terrible investors. <laughs> uh, that they, they all want to invest in, in what makes their next quarter not necessarily what's going to make a good return. And as Mayrav said, at the end of the day, 
IRR is, is easy to measure and we're all, at least at Amdocs, we're, we're measured on our IRR in the fund, um, mm -hmm. at, like, like Qualcomm. And, and uh, you know, we said, we can't have your cake and eat it too. If you want it to be strategic, then we won't make money. Maybe we'll be very strategic. Uh, you know, and that, that, you know, it's a hard balancing, it's a hard balancing act to try to be strategic, but at the same time, not be, not be impacted by the, by the desire to partner and invest in a partner. Mm -hmm. So some questions, um, you know, one from Lawrence, uh, are most of the opportunities sourced from inbound calls? How often are there prearranged terms for the buyout? At the initial investment, so I'll 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 go first on this, and then uh, Amir Tomer Mirav jump in. Uh, you know, Tomer mentioned this in the beginning of the call. Uh, the Israeli ecosystem is is amazing in its in its um, smallness, right? In its ability to to uh, it's deep, but it's not very wide, right? So so you're able to to get a sense of of the pool pretty quickly. Uh, so most of the deals come from entrepreneurs that we know, uh, from funds that we know, who think we can add value, or from from advisors. So it's a very, uh, you know, there there it's a it's a very uh, happy family from that perspective, where where good deals are known about pretty quickly. And in terms of terms, I would say this is this is a big deal. It's very important. Um, if in a competitive environment like venture investing for the good deals, don't kid yourself, you know, as friendly as we are, we're, the, it's, com it's competitive. Uh, it's competitive across corporates. It's competitive with financials. And, and there's no room, I think, in good deals to, to have what I would call off-market terms around rights or first refusal or rights or first offers that are, that are uh, onerous. I think there can be what I'll call information rights. If you're not sitting on the boards, so you can know if a deal is going to happen, maybe with a couple of key competitors. But that, even that, I think, is sometimes pushing it. I don't know, Amir, Tomer, Mehrab, what do you think about what do you think about terms, in ter uh, you know, strategic terms and for good deals? I, I like to say if there are if there are strategic terms and we get the deal, and it was probably a bad investment. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead, Mehrab. Yeah, for most deals, we wouldn't sign strategic uh, terms. In some cases, we have a right of first notice. And I have to say that uh, at least in one of my exits, it actually was helpful because the right of first uh, notice lets the, the startup actually do some shopping because they have to let the investors know and they have some time before they can get back to the person, to the one that gave them the offer. That's so good. in That's this specific, point. in this That's specific case, uh, the company actually uh, got a benefit from it. It, it, yeah. and it didn't, it didn't hurt. It's a contracted, the, they, it's a contracted cool off period. You know, exactly. I, I, they, uh, have no yeah. they, they can't yeah. close the deal, right? They have a contractual obligation yeah. To, yeah. to wait a little bit. And during that yeah. time, they can talk. That's a really cool. That was really, really, really helpful. Uh, although it, the, the acquirer was not part of the invest, uh, investors, it was someone else. So it was mm -hmm. it works really well. So uh, if if others are our strategies that if others have strategic uh, rights, we're getting them too. But we're never asking for them. Yeah, I think maybe two comments here. I think one. Um, uh, I think, like Moshe said, I think these time all all these kind of restrictive, you know, right of a uh, uh, first refusal, that kind of stuff. That's that's not market anymore, and it's really hard to get those. And and I think it's also um, it's disadvantageous also to the to the investor. So we wouldn't ask for that anymore. Um, we would ask for some sort of like Mayor Rob said, some sort of right of notification, which is just pretty bland. Uh, just gives you, hey, there's a notice. Um, typically, you, you you'll get some sort of indication i think if you build the right relationship with the company you would get it anyway because the company would want you to, to kind of engage in, in the acquisition discussions as well so I, I'm, I'm not sure that that would be super helpful um what i would say i think israel is different in a sense that um i mean maybe um different from like what we what i see in the, in the valley i think corporate vcs um 
have a much better access than, than what we see in the Valley. So I can get to, I guess, much better deals at, a, at an earlier stage than my peer group in, in California. And I think that's because we are able to build a really good reputation here um, for ourselves as, as investors, uh, which helps us to build that relationship with you know, the best in class financial players, with the best in class entrepreneurs. So we get those, you know, we get the access to those deals. Uh, and you know, I think it's because we're not um, trying to optimize on the, on the investment itself, trying to get all these um, onerous terms with, with the company. So I think that's really important to keep that as kind of as a standard. Cool. The only thing that I might add is that I think from my experience, at least from where I'm coming uh, in Israel, you will see more uh, competitors invest together in the same company, both in the early stage, and even create some kind of leverage uh, in the due diligence stage, uh, etc. It gives confidence for each investor to know this is the right bet. Uh, and doing it uh, still with keeping, you know, confidentiality without messing up the businesses of the two companies, etc. So I think you see less this kind of situation, for example, in the Bay Area. Yeah, I, I, I sit on a board um, of a company in Boston that, that has some pretty good VCs in there. We have NEA and, and Andreessen on the board. So it's, 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 a, it's a pleasure. And we were thinking about taking, about taking more strategic capital and the guy from NEA said something really interesting. He said, I have a rule, I have a rule that I, I don't count the, the number one for strategic investment. It has to start with the two. In other words, I need at least two strategics. Because if you know, in this case, we were talking to, to, to Intel and AMD. If I take Intel, then AMD won't work with me. If I take AMD, then Intel won't work with me. So let me just take them. If I'm going to take any of them, I'm going to take them both. Uh, so I, I think this idea of cooperation is is maybe forced in in the valley or in Boston. And he, here, I think it comes a little bit more natural to us. Uh, there's an, another question. I'm looking at the at the chat. Uh, you know, do we invest in incubated startups? So you know, uh, uh, ideas generated in house. That, that that's a really good question. Um, you know, a lot of companies do that. Uh, some companies don't. Um, you know, what we found, at least in Amdocs, the most successful way to do that is actually to spin out uh, a business. So we're actually long on, on spinning out entrepreneurship. So we call it intrapreneurship. I think that's the, that, that's the right way to think about it. But what, what we've done in the past is if there's something that that doesn't really sit or is not strategic with the rest of the business. There's not real synergy, but it's an area that we think has promise. We're very pro uh, building a new business around it and raising capital for, for them. With, and, and we maintain a significant position. I'm not hey, sure. Moshe, that would, with, that would you, know, mean, Jomer. you would and spin it out or how does, how does that would, work? We, we, we did this in, the, in London recently. We, it was an open source business. We're not an open source company. Um, yeah, there was an open source business that they weren't finding the right strategic help internally. Uh, so we actually spun it out uh, into a new mm -hmm. business. Yeah, you know, we we held twenty percent and we raised we ra we gave you know 30, 40 percent to management and we raised you know we we raised the rest you know um, from outside capital and it's been a, an amazing success. Uh, you know, sometimes so Cisco, you know that Cisco, Cisco was very famous at kind of uh, at you know the chamber days. They would they would create spin-ins, so they would take an engineering team, spin it out, like actually like take them out of Cisco, help them. And build they would the product, buy them, and then and they would buy them. And they would like buy five hundred million dollars. Wait, we just invested or, in or a money. company. We just invested in a company with the uh, the famous uh, Cisco yeah, BLS. BLS yes. Yeah, yeah. They're like so, going so out, have, starting a company, get investors and get put in again, right? 
Yeah. And the problem I with think, that I model, though, is it's, it's because it is, it is some sort of kind of it's it's taking R and D costs out of. I mean, if you if you if you know you're going to buy the business, you're actually taking R and D costs out of the books, which is kind of, you know, I, I think that's why we're not doing that anymore. It's it's, right. it's it is a little bit tricky from an accounting perspective. Um, it's also again, you could do that if you go to HR. I, I would think, right? If you have a good if you have a medium idea, we keep it in house. But if you have a really good <laughs> idea. Then we then 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 we 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 get, we take it outside with us, right? It, yeah. I mean that was our problem, yeah. right? You 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 don't want to create a, a perverse incentive for ideation and innovation and actually cause innovation to exit, right? Yeah, we we invest a lot in uh, in Qualcomm alums actually, uh, people that went out, uh, founded their own startups, and then they, we invest in them. So the there are many people in, that stayed in Qualcomm for 5, 10, 15 years, went out, and then uh, we know them well, we trust the team, team is very important, so we invest in them. So we have several in our portfolio, mostly in, in the US, some in India and in, in China, but uh, yes. Amir, let me, let me ask you a different question now. Uh, a lot of the people on the, on the call here are connected to Israel or want to be more connected to Israel. If someone were to move, you know, we're thinking about moving to Israel, starting a business in Israel, raising capital for it, or even trying to get it, you know, applying for a job at Western Digital, uh, you know, to, to work with the famous Amir Friedman. What, what, uh, what, what advice would you give someone, you know, watching this from home uh, or watching this from their, from their investment banking or law office, thinking about, wow, I, I'd, I'd really like to be doing something like this in Israel. What, 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 a, you know what? What are the steps that, that you need to take to uh, to come over here and and be successful as an entrepreneur, as a businessman, or as an investor? So first of all, wait until the Corona days will over, <laughs> and until the political uh, situation in Israel will be better as well. <laughs> uh, but seriously, uh, if we're talking about the uh, first Western Digital. So we have huge R&D center in Israel, which is not that common uh, for Western Digital. Uh, this is almost the biggest uh, R&D center outside of the US, both in the north, uh, south, and central of uh, Israel. And it's a pure engineering uh, uh, center. So if you're looking for business, don't come to Western Digital. Uh, now, if you're talking about uh, the investment ecosystem uh, or starting your own uh, startup, uh, you know, I can uh, talk like every other investor saying that the Israeli ecosystem uh, is the most innovative ecosystem outside of the US, and this is true. So, you know, you don't need the famous Samir Friedman to tell you this simply come to Israel. Uh, uh, the ecosystem here is very supportive. Um, although I would say that recently, uh, the seed investment was not that easy, at least from what I'm reading. We as a corporate VC usually invest more in the round B stage and the later one. Uh, but I think there is a very nice mix uh, between international and local VCs. And as uh, both Mirav and Thomas said before, it's a very small ecosystem and very supportive one. So we are waiting for you. And maybe Mirav, okay. no, Thomas, go ahead, Thomas. Thomas, go, go. Just a quick add-on. I think I think the the interesting part here is that there's a ton of um, tech talent here. You see a lot of great technical founders and people coming out of the military. You know, you've you've heard the story multiple times, so I, I won't I won't repeat it. But I think I think it's true, right? You have a ton of really creative, um, young, super talented technical folks. I think what Israel is currently lacking, uh, not currently. I think there's a lot, but I think what what someone who comes from a, a US educated kind of background can bring a lot of discipline around the go-to-market angle, around how to talk to customers, 
how to build a business. So having that, like coming to Israel, finding the right tech talent and having a, a, a kind of a US educated um, investment banker, lawyer, um, businessman, that is, is a really powerful combination. So I would say, you know, come in, find the right, you know, the right tech person and, and build a great business together. Yeah, and, and to just uh, double click on what Thomas said and maybe share the light on the, I mean, we're on the less nice things about Israel. We're, we're a small community of investors <laughs> The tech industry, uh, people talk a lot about how it's much easier to raise funds or get to a job when you come out of the right unit in the army or the right, uh, um, or the right uh, place you worked with, like uh, Intel or Cisco. So as Thomas said, if you're coming from the US, you should find an anchor. It could be a partner who's Israeli, who has the connections. It could be starting at uh, a company and then moving to you have your own business. And it could be as a starting as a lower position, like a associate analyst in a fund and then move your way uh, higher in the ranks. Because sometimes if you, you might find yourself less, less connected and find some of the things uh, harder actually. Because uh, network in Israel is really, really strong. Um, yeah. So that, that's I, my. I have, I have an Aliyah story as an Ole from, from uh, you know, from from the New York area. So I, when we were when I was an investment banker in New York before I moved to Israel, and we just decided one day to move to Israel, I walked into the head of investment banking. You know, at uh, at Jeffries, and I said, "I'm I'm leaving," and he's like, "You'll never make it." You know, you won't make you won't make anything compared to what you'll make here. You sh it's a bad idea. And this is like a you know Zionist Jewish guy, you know, and all that good stuff. And I said, you know, I'm just doing it. I don't care. <laughs> Pretty much, that was the end of the conversation. And I, I sent out you know six resumes a day, and eventually I got a job in two weeks. And 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 you know, from someone from New York, bu building the network actually takes time. And if I if I were to give to give a piece of advice to my former self, you know, 15 years ago moving to Israel, or to anyone thinking about it now, it's not to be ashamed to network, uh, and to not and to to start off and view your career as maybe lily pads as opposed to you know in New York you like to think about joining a place and becoming a career person in Israel it's kind of weird if someone works somewhere for too long I don't know it's like if people start to ask questions like what what happened did you did you get lost in the you know you know why why, why have you been there I'm talking to people who tell me you've been at Cisco for a long time May Rob you've been there Amir you've been there for a long time so I know the audience here is is a bit tilted but most of us you know work five six years and and then you 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 know something that is too good to be true comes in the door and 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 you move on uh, it's kind of you move in in packs with 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 friends and and net and with your network and you have to build that network. And it takes time, but it's an investment. Just like we invest in money in companies, you know, I, I would give myself the the piece of advice that investing in yourself is about networking, uh, and and it's an investment that that you that you will reap. Uh, over over decades to come, so so you, you should do that as much as you invest in companies around you. Great, cool. I think we we've got it. We've got our our questions done with. I don't know if uh, you know Amir, Tomer, Mirav. You wanna you you wanna raise anything else or Lawrence, our our fearless host. If you wanna raise something that that you think we should be talking about. Um, for me, at least, I can say this has been very informative. This has been great. Uh, the, <clears throat> excellent. It's an interesting perspective. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Moshe, that you were talking about for an American going over um, to Israel. There are a lot of Israelis who come over to America, too. <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe, maybe not for uh, the <laughs> purpose of... What was that, Tomer? That happens, that happens, yeah. That, that happens. 
Um, but you, you had mentioned something else also, which is uh, building the network. And again, I, I think I pointed out that YU has more alumni living in, uh, in Israel than other, uh, any other non-Israeli institution. Uh, part of why we're doing more and more Israeli themed events and these professional webinars is we do imagine Yeshiva University being the natural superhighway for human capital and financial capital to flow back and forth between the US and Israel. Whether Israelis coming here, looking for money, looking for a salesperson, looking for a VP, um, or Americans going to Israel, or people staying put and just looking for a resource. I need a, a lawyer or an account, a banker, uh, a board member. So whatever it happens to be, in terms of building the network, I think I sent out very early on uh, links to um, the LinkedIn pages for YU Wall Street and YU Technology Group. We suggest everybody sign up there, meet other people who have uh, been doing this. Um, I've been a board member of four different companies, um, uh, four public, one private. The one private I sat on was actually an Israeli company. Um, there, are, there are so many ways of, sorry, I have a, a 13 year old dog who just can't help but fall constantly. Um, but um, people should think about the YU as a great place to go ahead and build a network and, uh, and ask questions. And if you need somebody, please reach out. One of the reasons why YU does that is to create that fabric. It's also for the students. If people uh, have internship possibilities for the students, uh, please reach out. Uh, the students, especially in the COVID world, are very eager to go ahead and get some internship possibilities, job opportunities, or whatever it happens to be. Uh, you're looking for a professional. Again, you're at, uh, or your portfolio companies from Qualcomm, from Cisco, whatever it happens to be, needs a, a salesperson in the U.S. Try us. Uh, we have... Uh, we have we, we've got thousands of people in our network who are always eager to go ahead and hear about other opportunities, not students, but people working five, 15, 25 years, interested in working with great companies. So by all means, send those opportunities to us as well. Great. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions in the chat. I was just looking at some of them now. There's some really good ones. And uh, you know, at least for me, uh, if folks want, want, to, want to email questions across uh, that that's that's fine, um, and we we're ha happy to happy to take this offline as well. Well, Dan, thank you very much. This is our second to last uh, professional webinar uh, for the year. By the time we're done next week, we will have had twenty four events, seventy eight different panelists uh, speaking uh, on the YU webinars and and the in person events before we move to COVID. Uh, I think it's a testament to Yeshiva University is a place of ongoing education. Uh, people should continue to think about it, even if you didn't go to YU, your kids don't go to YU, doesn't matter. You're part of YU also. There's a place over here. The institution's tagline is Torah Umada. They're phenomenal YU Torah webinars and, and phenomenal uh, places to learn things uh, about Torah. Uh, I've been trying to spend uh, the last 13 years making sure we continue to uh, keep people educated on the Mata part of it, in business and technology, real estate, whatever it happens to be, and Meirav, and, uh, and, and Moshe, Amir, uh, Tomer, uh, you are a, a great audience, a uh, great panelist today. We really thank you for your insights. And we hope that everyone continues to stay involved and engaged in these discussions. Uh, next week's event is on health tech. We're doing one more health tech. We've done, uh, I think this will be the third health tech event. We are actually considering doing a new group in healthcare. Uh, if this dynamic continues, the same way we launched a real estate group and a marketing group, um, there seems to be a lot of interest in healthcare also. So maybe we'll build one out and be involved and tell us what you want to hear. And uh, if we can all give our silent chats or uh, clicks on the screens to, uh, to thank all of our panelists for their time and insights, it was really great. Wishing you all a very happy Hanukkah. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Be well, everyone. Thanks, Stay Lawrence. safe. Thanks. Bye, Thank everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.